Welcome everybody to the IGS lecture series. As most of you will know, this series was started just a few weeks after COVID lockdown started and is still going strong. And following one of the traditions of this series, we are using today's slot to have three early career speakers um, share one of the one hour seminar slots. Today, we're gonna hear from three different uh, people who are involved with the International Thwaites Glacier Collaboration. If you're unfamiliar with it, ITGC or the Thwaites Group is a very large collaboration primarily between US and UK scientists, but also including um, partners from COPRI and from Sweden and a little bit from Germany as well. Um, this uh, large project includes uh, marine geologists like myself, it includes oceanographers, glaciologists, modelers, and also experts in education and outreach. Um, so it's a large group of people, about 150 if you count everybody working on it part-time. Um, and today we tried to set up a series of talks that will take you through the ocean, the geology, and then um, ice components of this large project. And so I'll introduce each of the three speakers um, as we get to their turn. Um, and we are going to start with the ocean and then geology and then the ice, hopefully building a good understanding of this integrated system. So today's first speaker is uh, Ishi Zhang. Ishii is a PhD student at the University of East Anglia. She's about to graduate. She is a member of the Tarzan team, one of the eight scientific teams of uh, the Thwaites collaboration. Um, she was just at sea um, with me and others until about a month ago. We had a long field season this year, but I think she's primarily going to tell us about some of her older data. Um, so we'll see some of the data that's uh, been studied a bit more. So Ishi, when you're ready, please take it away. Sure. Thank you so much, Julia. I will just try to share. Can you see it clearly now? Yes, it looks good. Yeah, and I will also try to move the banner. Okay, great. So the title of my, um, of my talk is the reverse of ocean gyres near ice shelves in the Amazon Sea caused by the interaction of sea ice and wind. And I did this work with my supervisors, um, Dave, Karen, and Ben, and these are my co-author, Beth Shen, from the University of Gothenburg. And we want to thank the most lovely founding sources in the world. And as we want to, we want to thank the scientists, technicians, and crew working on the ITGC 2019 groups for everyone's hard work that allow this um, um sorry I can see something here that allow this um data collection to be possible and we also want to um specially thank rob latter the chief scientist on board and we also thank shinji um shinji joey from british um, antarctic survey for voluntary debugging my um a multi code day and night during the lockdown um it was it was very fortunate to have another modeler um, stuck at home with you during lockdown. Highly recommend. Um, this part of work has been published, um, not published, has been gone through the um, cross-sphere discussion review, and we just got some very nice feedback from um, reviewers. So if you want to know more details from that, you can always go to here. And, also, and then the last thing, as a PhD student, so with whatever question that you have receiving question going to make my day so let's just start here so this one is the map of the southeastern Amazon sea with the orange arrows showing the climatological wind field um, in this region and we have um, a dryer here right in front of pine ice shelf and this dryer has been well identified in both model and observations. And there's a mooring data show that this dryer might have reversed its direction once, but because we don't really have any long-term 
um, long-term observations in this region. So we don't really know why this drives here, and so we don't know why it reversed. And then in 2019, in our cruise, we found another dryer here in the west of Sweet Ice Tom. And there's a dryer um, identified by our um, shipborne ADCP, that's the velocity measurement. So you can see here, and this dryer is rotating in a different direction um, from the dryer that we know already from Pi the Ice Shelf. And this dryer was, re um, was recovered for the first time. Um, so then now we have two dryers in the same region and giving us another, another question, why do we care about those dryers? So the answer to that question is that because, so you can see here, um, we have some white dots here and some pink dots here. And they are the male water content of the whole water column. And the male water content is, um, is calculated from our ship-based CTD measurements from the same cruise. So during that time, during our data collection time, and we have very high male water content in the southeastern part and lower male water content in the, in the northern part. So this dryer, it might, um, it might be contributing to the entrainment of the, of the milk water from the um, sweet ice tongue northward. So um, this, this dryer can help transporting the milk water away from the ice shelf. And it could be also, um, this result could also be found in our paper in, um, in last year. And there's an annual link paper in um, last year as well. And, the dryer near ice shelf is also being reported that can be greatly influenced the melt rate. And it could be, um, it's published this year from our copre colleague, um, Song Tae. So the dryers near ice shelves are very important. And yet we still don't know why they are here and is a why do they, and why are they rotating in different direction? So why do I care the, um, the direction that much? That's because from the um, orange arrows that you can see here. And you can see that the, um, the wind field is blowing from the, from the ice shelf to the ocean. So it's always offshore. And the wind stress curve in the um, climatological wind stress curve in the Amazon Sea is always um, cyclonic, which means it's clockwise. So like that. So then in that case, how come that this dryer here could reverse and is how come that this dryer is rotating in a different direction? So to answer those two questions, we use um, idealized model. Um, so we were thinking that to, when we were designing our idealized model, we were thinking that what's the difference between those two dryers? And the thing that we found here is that we have for this dryer, for this dryer here, we have sea ice covering the southwestern part of it, while for this dryer, it's almost um, ice free. So, could a different sea ice condition cause different rotation for those two dryers? And that's the, that's the model that we use. It's called MIT GCM General Circulation Model. So we use the MIT GCM Idealized Biotropic Setup. Here's the schematic of our um, model domain. So we have an ice shelf in the southern part, in the southern boundary of our, ice, uh, of our dryer domain. And this dryer is a square domain with 60 times one kilometer in both X direction and Y direction. And also in the vertical direction, we have one layer of um, one kilometer water. Um, for the wind forcing, we use the idealized forcing. And this idealized forcing is based on the climatological wind in the, in the Amazon Sea. So for people that's not, uh, for non-oceanographer um, audience, it means that we have stronger wind-induced drag in the west and weaker wind-induced drag in the east. So it's like that. So we call it cyclonic and it's like clockwise and it's supposed to cause clockwise dryers because it's blowing like that. Um, so the magnitude and also the direction 
have the, um, have the same pattern as the climatological wind in the Amazon Sea, and also the size of the model domain as well. Um, there is no email water injection and there is no second quality water injection included in this model. So for this model, we purely talk about the um, these the sea ice and those are the wind um, that we only talk about their effect on our gyre. So here come um, here comes the map again, and then we have this wind forcing as as we just discussed um, before. So that's the similar wind forcing as our climatological wind um, wind field in the Amazon Sea for the dryer near the pine ice shelf here. So there's no sea ice with offshore wind. And for this one, for this dryer, so I highlighted the sea ice front here in the southwestern part, which corresponded to the sea ice cover here. So for this, for this dryer, we have another wind forcing for it. Um, which we have the um, sea ice covering this region, and we assume that the sea ice can completely block the wind stress filled by the ocean. So again, for our non-oceanographer audience, it means that there's no, no drag below the sea ice. So we still have drag um, in the ice-free region, but no drag in the sea ice covered region. So um, we run the model to its steady state. And here, here's the steady state model result. And for this dryer, the dryer near the pine dive shelf, and again, our wind field. And then here is the model result. And we have a, um, we have a cyclonic dryer clockwise. We have a cyclonic dryer formed here. So just like our Python ice, um, Python ice shelf dryer here. And then the next one, when we have the offshore wind, same as the previous um, model design, and, and with, this, with the sea ice coverage here. So again, with the sea ice coverage here, we have no drag below it. And then for the wind forcing here, we have, um, we have stronger drag in the west and weaker drag in the east. And the interesting thing that we care now is that you can see in the diagonal here, in the CS boundary, this side, we have some blue dots, which means that they have the positive wind stress curve. So that's the, um, and um, we call it anti-clockwise, which is like, uh, uh, we, we call it anti-cyclonic, which is anti-clockwise, so like that. And it means that we have stronger drag in the east. So that's because in here, we have drag in this side, but no drag here. So then it's, it will cause the small drag, as you can see my cursor moving here along the diagonal. And the positive wind stress curve along the diagonal is causing an anti-cyclonic dryer formed in our model. So that's exactly with what we observed in um, in the um, in the sweat dryer region. Um, so that's everything about those two dryers. So it means that our model can reproduce the key features of those two dryers. Um, can produce the, both the um, similar magnitude and the third direction. And to make our result more um, applicable to other regions in polar oceans, we then also run more experiments with different percentage of the, of the wind stress transfer to the ocean. So as you can see here, so the wind stress is tall. And so then we have different, um, we have several, several different model designs shown here. So that's 20% tow, it means that only 20% of the wind stress, the, the drag, can be transferred to the ocean. And then when it goes to 40, and you can see that the dryer, um, the modeled dryer is getting more cyclonic. So that's clockwise. And you can see the anti-cyclonic feature is fading away. And instead of that, it's forming two small dipole. Um, two dryer system here. 
And then with the stronger um, wind stress transfer to the ocean, so that's 80 percent toll. And then we will have an even stronger um, cyclonic dryer, and then to 200 percent toll. So for this one, for 200 percent toll, it means that the um, the wind stress transferred to the ocean is twice as as it used to be without a um, without the sea ice. So we designed this one. We designed this model experiment because there are also um, previous study showing that with the sea ice covering the ocean, if they are mobile, and when the wind is blowing the sea ice, and it will drag the sea ice, and then the the sea ice will drag the ocean and for and in that way the drag will be even stronger than it used to be so we here we just shown an extreme here um with the 200 percent toll transfer to the ocean so you can see um with the with longer arrows and then here again the dry became much much stronger and also more cyclonic so what we found is that when the dryer um, the dryer will become, will become more cyclonic when the percentage of the wind stress transfer to the ocean increase. And also we know that in polar oceans, the, um, the sea ice always have very peculiar shapes. So then we change the orientation of the ice front. So that's from, um, so the ice front is just a marginal ice zone as I shown you before, like for the for the giant near sweet ice shelf. They're similar to this one here. So we change the um, the the orientation of the ice front from this one, so similar to what we have to um, to like that. And then we change it from from the um, from pi over four and then to three pi over eight and then the other way around to the to the to the other direction and in our model result in our model gyre result we can also see that the change of the orientation of um of the of the ice front can solely reverse a gyre so you can see it's come um, the gyre is changing from a very a very weak cyclonic gyre and then to more um, to more cyclonic more cyclonic and then getting and then when they change the um when the when you change the direction you can uh, when the orientation changed the dryer can change its direction as well and we also tested our model with weaker gradient of um uh, with weaker gradient of the um of the of the wind stress transfer to the ocean and also with a broader so it's like a broader marginalized zone um, to see them you can find them easily in um, in our paper that's in the crossfield discussion so the conclusion the idealized broad tropical model can reproduce the observed direction um, of gyres with simplified wind stress co and sea ice condition and to generate the gyre we only need the special difference in wind induced drag so that's with just curl for our ocean of uh, um, audience. And CS conditions can modify the wind stress transfer to the ocean sufficiently to reverse an ocean, an ocean dryer. And our model might explain some features of dryers in polar oceans too. And that's everything. So I know the question will be left later, but. Uh, Thank you very much, Ishi. Um, that was a very nice talk. And you're right, we will hold questions um, until the end of the third talk so that we can try to stay on schedule. Um, so if you want to stop sharing, and Rachel, you can pull your screen up, but I'll just say, Ishi, that was a great start to our discussion and certainly a nice, um, nice set of points about the um, major role, just the shape of the margin can play. Um, simple changes and how the margins oriented. Um, and I'm sure people will be looking for your cryosphere paper. So our second speaker today um, is actually uh, one of my PhD students and she is going to present some of the sediment cores that have been collected 
offshore of Thwaites Glacier. And Rachel Clark um, is here to do that. And I'll just note that she is one of the only um, scientists to participate in all three of the field seasons that the uh, Thwaites project has had offshore. She's done all three cruises, um, which is an impressive feat. So Rachel, are you ready? Yep, thank you. Um, so I'm Rachel. I am, as Julia said, working as a PhD student at the University of Houston. And I'll briefly talk about my work on sediments that we've collected around Thwaites Glacier in the Amundsen Sea. So this is a picture of the vessel that we take south and we collect marine sediment cores and we uh, also collect geophysical data. So I know Ishii and Sam will probably have some repetition between us with this, but the region that we're studying is changing very rapidly. And we know that from satellite data and showing um, the glaciers in this region are retreating and they're losing their ice shelves or they're shrinking over time. But uh, what we haven't really been able to address is when these changes started happening. And that's because the data sets that we previously had only go back to the 1970s, which isn't far enough back in time to answer this question. So my aim is to use the marine sediment record right around these glaciers, specifically Thwaites, and um, push that timeline further back and also connect my data sets with these more modern data sets. So just some background information what, about what's happening to these glaciers. And I know we've, many people here already know this, but I wanna make sure we're all on the same page. There's this warm water mass that's usually going around um, the Antarctic continent, but more and more of it's being pushed up onto the continental shelf and melting the ice from below. And um, if we think about what happens through time, and I'm gonna use this cartoon of a glacier profile. So just to be oriented, this is grounded ice and then transitions into this floating ice shelf. Um, just at this initial set stage of the cartoon, if the ice shelf is thick enough, it can run aground on shallow seafloor highs or just ridges. But as that warm water comes in and melts the ice from below, it melts the ice at the grounding zone and also at the base of the ice shelf. So eventually you can lose that connection um, and you eventually will lose the back stress that that ice shelf used to provide through that friction. So today I'll show you some sediment cores that are from, uh, from these ridges. Um, I'm good, thank you, how are you? Is there someone talking? There is, yep, I'm there at the moment. Sorry, I'm just on a... Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so the idea that I want to approach is looking at the sediment record on these seafloor ridges to capture when um, this process started happening at Thwaites um, with the ice shelf thinning. So here's a, another schematic just showing how we collect data in this region. So our team will first map the seafloor and the subsurface, and then we'll collect sediment cores close to the ice front. And you can see there's a lot of arrows in all directions, um, indicating there are many processes that are important to geologists. And they all have different effects on what types of sediments will accumulate on the seafloor. But what's primarily important to think about for this talk is how close are we to the grounding zone um, or just grounding ice, grounded ice in general. So in this region, the sediments are going to be very messy looking and have everything from mud and sand to you know, actual cobbles. But as you move farther away from this grounded ice, you'll get a very different type of sediment. There'll be much smaller grains that um, are transported through this lower energy environment in the water column and then settle down on the seafloor. 
So just the relationship um, or spatial relationship with where the ice is grounded, whether it's a grounded ice shelf or the proper grounding zone will have an effect on the sediments um, I see and how I interpret them. So looking at the types of gear we use, because I know not everyone is a marine geologist, we have a lot of types of cores to collect these seafloor sediments, um, ranging in length to capture shallow or deeper sediment records. And the main one we use is this cast in core, which is three meters long. And you can see there's this sediment in here that sort of looks like Nutella. Um, and what we do next is we sample this, these cores very heavily. So uh, our team as a whole does a lot of work on these cores, but I primarily look at physical properties, like, the, like with this core, I would look at the size of the grains, the um, shape of the grains, and then also the properties of the bulk sediment down core. Um, and I've also started, uh, I've also started using um, CT scans to look at the internal details of these cores. And these are just, uh, this is a really nice type of data to have because you can see things with CT scans that you wouldn't necessarily be able to see with just the naked eye. So just to get you used to looking at these types of data, you have these packages of sediment or layers that are very gravel rich. So it's like white objects here. Those are cobbles basically. And then at the top, you, know, you see there's very different looking package of sediment that's just fine layers of mud. So I've looked at this type of data across Thwaites Glacier's margin and I've come up with different groupings of sediments. And we call these uh, different group sediment facies. And I've decided that there are five in this region um, that are useful for this work. And this is a pretty busy slide with a lot of text, but what's important to take away just looking at the example images is that the facies towards the left are gonna form in that more marine setting away from the grounded ice, um, have that nice fine mud accumulating. Whereas in the, towards the right side of this slide, there are um, these two facies with a lot of gravel and, <clears throat> excuse me, indicating they're from a more ice proximal setting closer to that ice contact. So now I'll move out of background information and show you where these cores are. So what we have to get oriented is Thwaites Glacier is grounded at, in the south towards the bottom of this image. Then there's a small floating ice shelf north of that. And then you can see where we've mapped the sea floor um, from multiple cruises. And then the circles, the red and yellow circles show cores that our teams collected over two different cruises. Today I'm going to look at just two of these cores. Um, which are gonna be JGC-17 and KCO-4, which are from uh, shallower water depths uh, on seafloor ridges, which is important because I think I can maybe address that history of unpinning using those sites. So I'm thinking that the ice shelf used to be pinned closer at these locations in the recent past. So we'll start with JGC-17. Uh, which I actually already showed you this core just to speed things along. This core is from a, you know, a site that's about half a kilometer in depth, water depth. And if we look at a cross section of the sea floor, which is what's shown here, that site is collected from a flattened summit. And that flat summit possibly indicates an ice shelf used to sort of bulldoze across that seafloor at one point in time. Um, but as I've already pointed out, there are these different layers of ice proximal looking sediments and then a sharp transition to more marine looking sediments at the top. And if we compare that to the other core site, KCO4, it's a longer core and it's in a slightly different geomorphic setting 
So the seafloor here, uh, the 2D cross section shows it's from a little basin that's on top of that summit. So it's probably capturing sediments in a different way. But if you look at these CTs, uh, the CT scan, which is shown in two different color schemes, um, you can see overall the sediments go from being gravel rich into dominantly that nice mud rich, uh, mud rich looking sort of um, more open marine type sediments. So we see a similar transition between the two sites and the next step is to figure out when this transition happened from this package into the uh, finer grained package. And to do that, I will briefly go through this and not uh, belabor it too much, but I use radioactive lead 210, which naturally, uh, it's naturally occurring and accumulates in the sediments as they're being deposited. And in an ideal situation, the lead 210 activity would decrease down core in older and older layers. And from this type of data, I can calculate when these layers accumulated over the past century, which is useful for what I'm trying to address with um, these two cores I've shown. So if we zoom in on the uppermost sediments, and you can see the scale on the left, um, we see in KCO4 that the lead 210 activity generally does decrease down core. And uh, what's lucky is we've captured this transition within that lead 210 profile. So this change from this gravel rich unit into this finer grained unit happened in the mid 20th century. And so what I'm interpreting here is that when these gravel rich packages are being deposited, the ice shelf is pinned at or near these two sites. But then afterwards, when we switch to this more marine style deposition, that ice shelf has thinned and you have you know, a thicker water column above these two sites. So basically this is showing unpinning. If we, um, so if I wanna think about this in map view, um, and I want to think about what this means for how the ice shelf has been unpinning over time spatially. And what I've aimed to do with these schematics I'm about to walk you through is um, I've used these core sites as tie points, and then I've used the C4 bathymetry to extend those interpretations out. But it is schematic. So here this is a uh, an image I'm using to represent prior to this unpinning. So there's these yellow polygons show the ice shelf is pinned to a pretty broad area. But then as we step forward in time, um, we can see that the ice shelf starts to lose contact on that western high. And, um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, oh, the ice shelf starts to lose contact on that western high presumably because that warm circumpolar deep water is coming in and thinning the ice shelf. Um, we also know that from other records that the ice shelf was pinned to the seafloor uh, in the east for a you know, longer time. So let's trying to connect those records here. And then today we know that the ice shelf is only pinned in uh, a small area to the east and it's continuing to unpin today from the seafloor. So uh, my last thoughts are that um, I want to explain to you that these results and interpretations are not happening in a, a vacuum just at Thwaites Glacier, but a very similar study found um, at Pine Island Glacier where Yishi was talking about her research. Um, the ice shelf there started to unpin from a seafloor ridge at a very similar time. Uh, we also know from other sediment records uh, in the Amundsen Sea that circumpolar deep water advection started to increase in the mid 20th century. So there's a regional story that's happening here indicating this timing is significant. Um, and like others, I've started to suggest that there are some external factors driving 
this increase in circumpolar deep water and subsequent ice shelf thinning. Um, so that could range from, there's a car driving by, that could range from shifts and changes in the atmospheric wind patterns, as well as more discrete events like an El Nino. Um, but I'm hoping this work helps other researchers explore those drivers and th that seem to be external and not internal to Thwaites Glacier. So uh, with that, I want to thank you for listening to my talk and I look forward to your questions at the end of the session. Okay, thank you very much, Rachel. That was a nice overview. I see people virtual clapping. Um, so to stay on schedule, Sam, if you could please pull up your slides and we will have questions for all three speakers at the end. Um, our third speaker today is Sam Kachuk. Samuel is a postdoc at the University of Michigan, and he is going to talk to us about uh, the calving front. Whenever you're ready, Sam. Yeah, so I'm actually taking up from exactly where uh, Rachel has left me, and I'm going to talk about some of those internal drivers of what's going on at Pine Island and Thwaites. Um, and I'm really excited to be here live. Uh, I usually have to catch these later from the YouTube channel. Uh, as Julia mentioned, I'm Sam Kachuk, a postdoc at the University of Michigan, uh, where I study ice sheets primarily through modeling. I'm looking forward to telling you about some of my very recent work, but first, I'll acknowledge that I do this with a great many number of people, um, including the Vintage Glaciology Group here at the University of Michigan. Uh, I've been working with a bunch of folk from uh, Lawrence Berkeley and the Los Alamos Labs, and of course the ITGC, Domino's, and the general community whose cross-disciplinary structure has really spurred a lot of productive co uh, conversations and ideas. So I think we're all familiar here that ice is solid, and so it fractures but that it's also fluid, so it flows. And those fractures flow with it and extend and join up with each other or new fractures, as we see happening in these satellite images of the Pine Island Glacier, which is a neighbor to Thwaites um, down here, which we've been looking at quite a bit in the last two talks. We have an intuitive sense that this cracked and damaged ice in the margin is different somehow from the smoother, more connected ice in the main trunk of the stream. Uh, but how do the cracks develop? What effect could they have on the flow of the ice? Why does it seem like there's a kind of a, a point at which the, dam the, the cracks begin to propagate downstream? And how can we represent these in our models? The dynamics have a crucial uh, effect on our projections, for instance, at Thwaites glaciers, where the breakup of this Western ice tongue in about 2002, um, when it really started to crumble, it sped up and it dragged the eastern ice shelf with it across its shared margin into that pinning point that Rachel was showing us. And it's possible that that driving it into that pinning point has, has, has generated uh, rifts that are propagating today um, and endangering that, um, that ice shelf. So these margins contributed both to the buttressing, but also to the fracturing. To make projections using a large scale ice sheet model, we typically start from a given gridded topography, thickness, and temperature product. We're very grateful for the teams who put those together. But throwing these into the equations of motion don't yield velocities that match up with observed velocities. So what to do? Well, we invert a spatially variable frictions field underneath the grounded ice, and a factor to change the ice's viscosity so that it, at, the, at least at the very first time step, things match up. Our, our computed velocities look a lot like our observed velocities. And then we can integrate these equations of motion forward in time, solving for thicknesses and velocities. Now it's worth mentioning at the outset that it's possible that the exponent we're using in our equations of motion isn't the correct one. But for now, we'll continue under the common assumption um, and, and, and move forward. With some exceptions, Many models assume that things like the topography, the temperature, the friction, and this viscosity fudge factor uh, remain constant in time. Of course, most of them in general will evolve with time, and some models are incorporating these effects. Temperature will diffuse and advect as it interacts with the atmosphere and the ocean and the flow of the ice. Subglacial hydrology 
affects the friction at the bed. And glacial isostatic adjustment will change the shape of the bedrock topography in important ways. But for now, we're going to focus only on the viscosity multiplier. Taking a look here, again, to orient, here's Pine Island Glacier uh, Shelf, Thwaites. And this is the inverted viscosity multiplier so that the bicycle's ice sheet model can match the observed velocities at 2010. Just to describe phenomenologically some features, the margins, let's pointing out Pine Island, uh, appear in red, which means they require softening, a lower viscosity. The central trunk shows up as blue, which requires a stiffening. These variations across, across this flow could be due to a whole suite of effects, including the fact that our initial guess at our temperature might not be quite right, with the main trunk being a little bit colder and the margins being a little bit warmer or a little bit wetter. In addition to temperature, though, things like the ice fabric, cracks and crevasses, like we saw in those satellite images, could contribute to these inferred differences in viscosity. These fall under the umbrella term of damage, which means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Some models, for instance, define damage as the part of this viscosity, this inferred viscosity multiplier that caused the softening. Um, so let's take, a, let's take a sec to step back. What we're looking for with damage is some continuum approximation so that we don't have to stop and keep track of every individual crack, say, using linear elastic fracture mechanics. It would take really long, and it's not even clear that we could initialize all of those cracks just right. It's at the bounds of our observational and computational abilities. So a continuum approximation that maintains the directionality of the cracks would still rely on a very complicated tensor that has no easily clear geometric interpretation. So we leave individual cracks behind and treat nice isotropic fractures called penny fractures, shown here in traditional volume element form as Swiss cheese. Although in this kind of Swiss cheese, the holes are filled with inviscid cheese. I guess it's whey because usually we treat the cracks of the, these fractures as being filled with ice that's inviscid. So the, there's no density change. Geometrically, damage in this is the ratio of the area occupied by the penny fractures, these, to the total area of a face. How do these fractures evolve over time on the time scale of ice flow? To get there, I'm going to zoom out even further to a vertically averaged crevasse depth, which includes a long wavelength crevasse. And analogous from before, damage is the ratio of these crevasse heights to the total thickness of the ice. Now, how does this help us? Well, because ice is shear thinning, if we perturb the thickness of the ice to thin it a little, the forces are applied over a smaller area. This increases the apparent stress, which decreases the effective viscosity of the ice. That'll drive further thinning, a process that continues until those long, long wavelength crevasses or a neck, as you see here, pinches off the thickness. What we might understand as a calving event, or if not, then uh, being ready to calve if by, some, by some external forcing. Via a perturbative approach, uh, Bassus and Ma found that the rate of crevasse growth relative to the thickness of the ice depends on a competition between the hydrostatic or cryostatic pressure tending to force these crevasses closed and the tensile force forces pulling them open. So now we have a vertically averaged model of damage that I can use to take a look at what's happening in the, in the Amundsen Sea. So using that evolution equation for damage, here damage goes from zero at white to one, that kind of ready to fracture, I suppose, stuff, we can compute an initial steady state distribution for damage at Pine Island and Thwaites. To generate this particular picture, we hold the thickness of all of the ice constant. We don't allow the damage to affect the ice, it's, it's along for a passive ride. And although we take the initial temperature distribution to make our first guess at the ice viscosity, we don't use that viscosity multiplier that matches the initial velocities to the observations. So the only training used here is the one from the friction field in the grounded portion of the ice upstream. Despite that, 
the amp the damage that we compute is is actually really reminiscent all right i need to turn my pointer back on really very reminiscent of the inferred viscosity multiplier so let's compare them here we have the damage that we computed again without use without using the viscosity multiplier without any training whatsoever and the viscosity multiplier that came from that inference from that inverse process there's quite a bit of scatter but generally there appears to be a negative correlation where higher damage is associated with lower viscosity and remember that that again that steady state was was not used any fitting so so this is this scatter can be due to some amount of smoothing which is in that inferred uh, viscosity multiplier so it'll tend to spread out those margins and the the damage equation can be quite quite localized um, in the ice stream and some of the the scatter is probably going to be due to temperature variations that's just not going to be included in the damage equation that we have our damage evolution predicts very little uh, damage in the grounded portion. So we can't compare the, the viscosity multiplier there just yet. So right now we're looking at only the Pine Island ice shelf and we're, we're only looking at one ice shelf to hopefully kind of waylay biases and temperatures that might occur between um, ice shelves. But theoretically, what, what relationships might we expect between damage and viscosity? There, there are two broadly used. One possibility, is to assume that the effect on large-scale rheology is the same as damages effect on microscopic rheology and apply this the same effective stress model. Remember, as the ice thinned, it enhanced that stress and allowing it to pull further. This is uh, the approach used in models like Borstad's and Sun's. The other end member could be to assume that damage has no effect on the rheology at all until it does catastrophically, i.e. by calving and the fully damaged ice is immediately made inviscid and removed. This has been implemented in models such as the Nye Zero Stress Model, for example, in um, Burke and Bass's 2022. But if we take these two as end members, it's possible that anything within this space is admissible. It's possible that small amounts of damage have little to no effect on large-scale rheology. Similarly, it's possible that fully damaged ice isn't immediately evacuated and maybe doesn't become inviscid immediately, but still retain some ability to flow within the ice. So what I wanna look for now is a monotonically decreasing relationship between the damage uh, and the viscosity multiplier. And I'm gonna allow for a general offset to capture kind of any average bias in temperature with our initial field. We could choose any number of functions, uh, but some high resolution granular modeling by Astrom and Ben suggests that an exponential function like the one represented here, this is a hyperbolic tangent, uh, captures the transition from diffuse fractures to highly fragmented ice um, with this kind of delayed start and, and exponential shutoff. The vertical offset at the zero damage intercept right here translates to a temperature about three degrees colder than our input temperature. And the function suggests that crevasses averaging about a third of the way through the ice thickness have very little impact on the bulk rheology. And that the ice isn't evacuated and could still be rheologically important. This only goes down to about 50% uh, in the viscosity. We'll need to examine the possibility of calving in the future, but at least what we have right here is a way of computing damage, evolving it in real time with the ice, and computing its effect on the viscosity dynamically using only four parameters instead of the millions plus some regular regularization to get the um, the inference smooth. So let's see what happens to Thwaites and Pine Island. So take note as we watch this how Thwaites western ice tongue thins and disappears around 2021, it's already long past, and then watch these high damage intrusions Kind of develop in the margins of Pine Island ice shelf and it backed forward uh, uh, as the calving front gains damage and retreats a little bit. Surprisingly, Crossan here experiences significant retreat um, and damaging. And finally, kind of enjoying this image, we can we can look kind of at a static image of what the dynamic viscosity does to thickness compared to that constant multiplier that we were using before. These results are extremely fresh, 
there's no significance at all to 2076, except that it's where the run has made it so far. Uh, and pay no mind to these weird blotches in the thicknesses differences. They're the result of uh, adaptive mesh and comparing them between two runs that have different resolutions there. But focusing on the ice shells, we find minor increases in the thinning at Pine Island and Thwaites, and pretty significant additional um, thinning at Cross and Ice Shell. There is a pretty big caveat here, though, and if you'll allow me to channel Paul Simon, there seem to be about 50 ways to break up an ice shelf. And determining the conditions under which an ice shelf will remain stable uh, will definitely increase my confidence that we're using the right physics. So to wrap up, uh, we're exploring a forward model of damage that can recreate the commonly used viscosity multiplier with just a few fitted parameters. And this model evolves in time and has an effect on the computed velocity field. Our preliminary results show promise and highlight the importance of temperature measurements and modeling, particularly in the margins of these ice streams, to contribute in disambiguating these processes from each other. And I'm really looking forward to your comments and questions. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Sam. That was fantastic. Um, I'm sure there are going to be some questions for Sam as well as the first two speakers. And so if people want to raise their hands, um, we can go in order of the raised hands online in Zoom. Um, and then um, I guess Tavi will also um, read from Facebook when just she'll just jump in. Um, with Facebook questions. Anybody want to raise their hand? I will start then um, while people are prepping their um, questions and I'll ask Sam, in the images you were just showing, um, you talked about all the way down to Crossen, but the images also show Dotson, which you didn't mention, and it looks very stable and unchanging, but I don't think that many of us who have seen it would expect that. Do you want to comment on Dotson at all? Um, I would love to. I haven't had the chance to, to really look through this. This is all extremely fresh. And, okay. and honestly, my, my familiarity has been pretty focused. Um, so I actually, I, I, I need to look down um, and see, so, so could, you, could you tell me a little bit about what well, you would have expected at Dotson? A lot of the initial um, or the recent images of Dotson, and that goes for recent satellite images, it goes for the helicopter flights, it goes from our view from the ship um, this year, it goes from the AUVs. Um, so sort of everywhere we've looked at Dotson in the last year or two, the response has been, wow, man, look at all of that. How is, it, how is it still pinned there? How is it still together? Um, you know, it looks really um, crevassed and broken up and hard to land on. And yet, you, again, what it looked like in the models you were showing there was that it didn't really do anything. Yeah, and the, the damage there is, is, is low. So, so that, and that's why it, it won't accumulate. I, I should mention that um, the, the, the velocity fit does kind of decrease as you go further away from Pine Island because I fitted I th that temperature bias ends up becoming important. Um, and there's it seems to have a, a different temperature bias dependent on which ice shelf uh, you look at. And so it, it gets it gets increasingly worse as you go further west. Um, and so one of the next steps is going to be to figure out what to, to take it from an, an ice shelf by ice shelf perspective to see if we can get something something different. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Doug, I see you have a question for Rachel. Yes, thank you. Uh, Rachel, what a fantastic talk. Uh, just as good as the other two talks. All three of them were wonderful. Um, my question is, uh, when I was um, a graduate student, I was told that there could have been a much, much larger ice shelf in the Amundsen Sea that uh, completely buttressed both Pine Island and Thwaites and things like that. Is there any way to tell from your core data whether that is a plausible idea? 
that, that a bigger ice shelf had been there before any humans actually got into the area to see it. Yeah, so my data doesn't necessarily um, address that because I'm so close, I'm so much further south, so kind of out of that realm of the extended ice shelf or it would have already been covered, but there are papers that have strongly suggested there was the larger ice shelf, I think. Um, I think maybe Kirshner et al. 2012 has that, um, but also, the sediment signature of an ice shelf can be very difficult to distinguish from open marine settings, um, depending on um, sedimentation rate so and sediment sources. So uh, right now I'm not, I can't address that with my work, but we have enough cores that cover that area that could approach that even more. So. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. And Lisa Herbert has a question for Ishii. Hello. Hi, Ishii. Great talk. Um, uh, it's good to see you. <laughs> like, I was on this trip with good her to see and you too. and Julia, so it's great to see all you and a few others here. Anyway, um, yeah, all great talks. Um, I really enjoyed all three. And um, Ishii, I was wondering about, um, I just need to like brush up on my physical oceanography, <laughs> especially in the Southern Hemisphere. But um, in terms of the direction of like the rotation of the gyres, um, yeah. would that play a role in like the degree of upwelling of deep water to the surface and like the transport of things like nutrients from deep water to the surface? Yeah, good question. You will. Yeah. Um, but for, for, Python, for, for the giant near Pine Island Shelf, um, it has an upwelling because it, it has a dome. But for the yeah. anticyclonic gyre, it's like that. It's yeah. downwards. Yeah. So the strength of the of the gyre it could cause. So if the gyre is stronger, then the um, then the upwelling or downwelling would be would be stronger too. Okay. Yeah. So, so the upwelling was in the the one by. It's the, actually yeah. For Pine Island. Yeah, it's right in front of Pine Island shelf, but okay. it's actually not like upwelling. It's just like a is is shaping the the uh -huh. isopic nose. Okay, gotcha. So I'm not so sure about the the vertical. So it's not going to pump all the way. Through, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have a paper from um Chago's um Chago's paper, um that's just submitted to to Nature Comps recently, um right under review. Talk about it, about the doming of the of the dryer. And also how the um, how the dome of the gyre will affect the heat transported into the um, into below ice shelves. So mm -hmm. you can you could probably try to keep an eye on that paper. Yeah, yeah, I'll look yeah. out for that. Thanks a lot. Great talks, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Do we have any other questions from the Zoom audience? And Um, do we have any from Facebook? Um, I can't see any on Facebook, but I had a question from Rachel, which I was um, I was peering at the radar landscape there, trying to see how much um, streamlining and sort of drumlins and all the conventional sort of uh, glacial features there were. And I thought I could see some, but I was interested that none of your sediments appeared to be what you I would consider to be sort of subglacial. They were all marine um, sediments. And I just wondered if maybe I imagined the sort of uh, subglacial landscape or whether there was any evidence of grounded ice in that area at all. Yeah, that's a really good observation. Um, yeah, most of the sediments we've collected in the area are from, you know, they might be ice proximal, but not necessarily subglacial. Um, mostly indicated by the sediments are very soft. You would expect under the ice, the sediments be very stiff and compacted, but we do see evidence that the ice was grounded over this region. Um, there's uh, been some geomorphology work done. I, I could pull up a slide and there are some streamlined features you can see on the maps, but um, there has been some geomorphology work done on the recently collected um, bathymetry data. That's a Kelly Hogan's 2020 paper 
in the cryosphere. Um, showing at one point in time, the ice sheet did extend further out. Um, and then there's kind of another issue with the, the types of coring devices we use have a hard time getting into that really stiff subglacial sediment. So um, yeah, we kind of we kind of missed that part, I guess, in the record, and we'll probably get right above it, but can't get into it. So since it's so stiff, yeah. Okay, thank you. Need to get some more, I guess. Um, no more questions then. Uh, before we wrap up, I will um, advertise next week's talk. Um, usually, there's just one a month with three speakers. Um, but next week on May 4th um, will be a special presentation. Um, there's the um, advertisement for it. So the speakers will be Helen Fricker, uh, Tavi, and myself will present a set on DEI efforts in the cryosphere community. Um, Helen will uh, give a broad overview about how to better the cryosphere community. Um, I will focus on the efforts specifically of the Thwaites collaboration, um, which the three speakers are part of. Um, and then Tavi will um, talk about how this seminar has played an important role in building community and doing so um, with a low carbon footprint. Um, so thank you to the three speakers from today. I've seen lots of clapping and nice comments in the chat. So thank you to all of them. And I, I think I might go watch again on YouTube so I can make sure to learn everything you guys have taught us today. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.